So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Eventually, he got around to making us. He made a lot of stuff, is, is, is the point. And, you know, in between making all the stuff, most of it was pretty normal. I mean, most of it kind of easily falls into uh, a, an easy category to, to think about, um, you know, how God made stuff. You know, you know, the birds, and you got mountains, and you've got the sky, and you've got uh, pan pizza from Pizza Hut that we can sadly no longer order. It's perfect, guys. It's the world's perfect pizza. And I don't know. It's gone now. We have to. Gone. So God made all that. Is the point in a roundabout way. Because they closed. No, Ashland closed. Anybody listening online is like, what is going on right now? It's fine. Yeah, they closed. It's now uh, like an architect place or something. I don't know. Anyway, enough about pizza. When God made people, though, it was a little bit different. You see, for example, so like when God decided to make light, which is a thing we take for granted as a thing, uh, God had to make that. So when God made light, all he did was speak it into existence. He just said, let there be light. And sure enough, there was light. It was like poetry that could come to life. It was like, you know, prose that could be formed out of molecules and physics and things like that. That's how God did that, right? That's how, you know, a lot of this went is God just kind of spoke it and it just went into existence. But with people, something really interesting happened when God went ahead and made people. As the story goes, God took something that was pre-existing. He took the planet, he took the earth, he took the dust of the earth, and he gathered it all together, and he molded it into his hands, and he formed a person. And then... He breathed into that person's nostrils, it's very specific, a soul, the breath of life. That's how God made people. He took the dust and he took the essence of life, a soul. He mashed them together and out came us. Which is a lesson. I mean, this is a lesson to us, really. This is something that should teach us exactly who we are. You see, we are always, whether we like it or not, connected to this world we live in. Like, we're part of it. Like, we were made out of the same stuff. <laughs> like, our DNA, our essence, our, you know, molecules, our atoms, it's all the same as all the stuff around us. We were made from the dust, right? It's, it's the whole, like, from, you know, dust we come to the dust we return. That's the way this works. We are connected to this world in a way that we can't deny, that we can't uh, argue with, that we can't change. It just is what it is. And at the same time, we are connected to God. We have God's divine essence within us. We're not only just made in God's image. We're not just made in God's image. We're made of God's stuff, essence, uh, breath. I don't, I don't know what you want to call it. The soul that we have that makes us us comes from God directly. So whether we like it or not, whether we want to change it or not, whether we want to argue with it or not, we are all, 100% of us, us human beings, we are connected to God. That's what a human really is. A human is like the meeting place between the earth and heaven. It's the meeting place between like mortality and divinity, right? Like we are, we come from the earth and we come from God both mashed together. We're a remix song. In other words, God is our DJ. Let's not do that one. I don't like that illustration. But we have both of these. We are connected. We are connected to God at all times. No matter what, we are connected to the world. No matter what. That is how people were made. That is, that's how we're supposed to understand. When we look in the mirror, we should see the earthly and the divine. So that's how we are. That's who we are. And so God made people that way. Mm. God made a person that way. The story calls him Adam. And so that's how Adam was made. Okay. But it turns out, that's not how anyone else was mm, technically made. As the story goes on, God does something else that's a little odd, a little interesting with the next batch Generation 2.0, if you would. This is what we read in uh, the book of Genesis. This is what we read. 
It says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Well, the man slept, the Lord God took out of one of the man's ribs and took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Now, the reason for this story that we're given in Genesis, okay, and I, and I want to be upfront because I'm going to give you a reason that's not in Genesis, but the reason that's in Genesis here is because there wasn't a suitable helper for Adam. Like, there's, there's Adam, and he's, uh, he's not by himself. I mean, like, there's dogs, and there's cats, and there's raccoons, and elephants, and velociraptors, and there's animals all over the place, right? Like, there's all sorts of stuff. But at the end of the day, like, you know, Adam, there's nobody else like him. God made animals out of the dust of the earth. Genesis tells us. But God doesn't do the same breathing a soul into them that he does for us, which makes us unique, but also if you're Adam, made him lonely. So God decides, I'm going to make for him another person. And, and, and again, I, I need to be upfront here. Uh, the book of Genesis relates this as uh, sort of a parable for marriage. Right. So like, you know, Adam and Eve, they are like they're the first people, but they're also the first parents. Cain and Abel show up like something goes wrong with those guys. But, you know, when they were babies, I'm sure they were adorable. And, you know, it was much less murdery when, you know, Cain is 11 or maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what his life was about. But they're the first parents, they're the first married couple, they're the first, you know, everything else. And so the book of Genesis really hammers home, like, this is why somebody leaves their mother and father uh, to go be with, with someone else. So we're talking about marriage and all of that in Genesis. That's sort of the application that whoever wrote Genesis um, wanted us to see. Unsaid in the story. Unsaid in Genesis, but equally true as the story demands, however, is this. Eve is not just the first woman. Eve is not just the first wife to the first husband. Eve is not just the first mother to the first sons. Had they never gotten married, had they never had sons, this would still be true. That Eve is the second person. It's really simple. It's not a really profound statement. But, but Adam is the first one. <laughs> He's the first one. Eve is the second one. Which means, once we go from a person to people, something changes. Once we go from one to two, there's a big difference. And that difference and that change is not about marriage, at least solely. Uh, it's not about, well, we're going to have kids. It's not, it's not about any of that. It's simply about one and then there's two. Had Eve not been a mother, had Eve not been in, in the story, obviously, if Eve had not been a mother, had they not been married, she's still the second person. Which means we should go back to what Adam just said. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Adam was saying that not just to his future wife, not just to the future mother of these, you know, two sons, but instead... Adam was saying that to the second person that existed because the story demands that that's the way it is. People come from people. We have shared DNA, cells, molecules, uh, atoms, all of that. We have a shared story. We have a shared history. We have a shared place in the world. People come from people. And if we've got this story right, and God making humans out of the dust means we're connected to the earth, whether we like it or not. And if we've got the story right and God breathing a soul into us, sharing his divine essence with each of us means that we are all connected to God, whether we like it or not. Then God making the second person out of the rib of the first person means people are all connected. Whether we like it or not. No matter what. We are connected one to another. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is who we are. Which is a rather compelling, I would say, uh, antidote to basically all the kinds of bigotry you can think of. Racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, xenophobia, 
uh, you know, not liking people because of, you know, where they come from or what religion they are. We haven't given fancy words for that. We should. We should have fancier words so I don't have to add different words for like, like, what is the, re what is the religious version of sexism? We should have an ism. Religionism? That doesn't sound right. But like, whatever it is, whatever the, whatever kind of bigotry we have, there's a powerful argument from the book of Genesis, from the very first story of the very first people that tells us we are all connected. That whoever it is that, that when, whoever the other person is in your world, whether it's another person that you like or don't like, that you are connected to them. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, same atoms, same molecules, same story, same place in the world, same made in the image of God, same made from the dust. We are the same, connected all the time. Whether we like it or not. Whether we're happy about that or not. Or not whether we're married to them or not. This is the way humanity is. Human beings are connected to the earth. Human beings are connected to God. And human beings are connected one to another, no matter what. And Adam, as it turns out, the story tells us, went to sleep. And when he woke up, this fact was obvious. Now that's actually, this is not actually one of the, it's not just one of the first stories of people in the Bible. This is actually the first uh, instance of someone going to sleep in the Bible. And you might think, that's a really random detail. Like, why is that there? And let me tell you, you'd be right. It is pretty random. But there's a funny thing about the Bible sometimes. is the Bible has these things sometimes that seem really random and seem really out of left field, and yet they sort of begin to develop a pattern. One of the patterns we begin, we begin to see, if both the Old Testament and the New Testament, throughout the scriptures, is this. People go to sleep. They wake up, and God has done something. It sounds really simple and basic, but it happens. People go to sleep, and while they're sleeping, God is not sleeping. God is working. God is doing stuff. And so they wake up and hear, discover what God has doing. This is, in fact, a, a rather compelling uh, illustration for all of Christianity. That we are sleepers, Paul says in the book of Ephesians, in a passage we will undoubtedly quote at some point over the next month or so. Paul talks about how we are sleeping. We are sleepers, and we need to wake up to what God is doing. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it means to experience Jesus. That's what it means to follow the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what it means is to wake up to what God is doing. We are asleep, but while we sleep, God is still working. And the interesting thing about this is this is not something, I think often we would use this illustration to kind of talk about like, well, you know, converting, right? Like I wasn't a Christian and I was asleep and then I become a Christian and I'm awake. And I got to tell you, that's not the way the Bible actually uses this illustration. The Bible uses this illustration for people that are either directly God's people, like in the case of Adam, or uh, directly Christians, which is the case in the New Testament. And that's really, really important because here's how this illustration works, okay? We are asleep, God is working, and we need to wake up to what it is God's doing, okay? But we often think that about other people. Like, well, they need to wake up to what God's doing. I'm a Christian, so I know. Because so often we get the impression that, like, the second we get baptized or the second we join a church or the second we accept Jesus or whatever, the second we're, okay, we're Christians now. The second we do that, like, well, you know, I, I guess I've got all the answers, and now I know things, and now I better defend the things I know instead of continuing to ask questions. <laughs> I better go ahead and defend all the stuff that I know up until this point because that stuff must be right. Paul talks about waking up and sleeping people waking up to Christians. and I, That's me. I'm a Christian. We're Christians. We're called to wake up, sort of, not unlike how Adam wakes up, to this new understanding of himself and other people and God and the earth and everything else. He goes to sleep, he wakes up, and boom. And it's not just a person, it's now people. And he learns. It's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This morning, we're in our first week of our series called uh, While You Were Sleeping. The next five weeks, we're going to talk about people who are sleeping and what they learn when they wake up. And what we're supposed to learn as we wake up as well. And as it turns out, actually, this morning, we're not just going to talk about bigotry. Because, look, 
I'm 37 years old. And here's what I've learned. No one thinks they're bigoted. I've never met a sexist who's like, oh, yeah, I think women are totally inferior to men. I've never met that person. Maybe, like, that dude's out there somewhere. His name is probably Kyle. And I'm sorry. That was – the joke shouldn't come from my head. We just all know Kyle. We all know a Kyle, right? We all know a Kyle. It, somebody's not coming back to church next week because their nephew is named Kyle. Anyway, um, apologies to all Kyles. Like, I'm sure that guy exists, but, like, it's not usually how it works. It's not usually how it works. Like, I've never met anybody that's like, oh, man, I just, I just don't think gay people should be treated like people. They just do it. <laughs> they don't say it. They just do it. It's, 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 it's this weird thing. So, as it turns out, just saying, like, it's not really enough to say, like, well, don't be bigoted. Because everybody's going to nod their heads like, yeah, well, I'm not that. I don't need that sermon. As it turns out, as we wake up to the way that we treat other people, we need to learn from somebody who absolutely understood, completely understood the lesson that Adam learned. He needed to learn a different lesson. And as it turns out, he is my favorite Old Testament character. And his name is Jonah. So, Jonah. His story is set in like the 8th century. And the 8th century is really famous in the biblical narrative because that's the, that's the century, that's the time period when the people of Israel were conquered by another empire called the Assyrians. The Romans get all the headlines when it comes to most of our conversations about this, but the Assyrians were just way worse than the Romans when it came to, you know, the way that just in, in the historical world things were. The Assyrians were absolutely notorious for being uh, cruel, for being you know, just kind of going over the top, like just overkill. Like they didn't need to do the things they did, but they did it anyway. And, and as they conquered, they sort of wanted to send a message as they conquered. Like it wasn't enough to conquer people. They wanted to just like pound people into submission in just the most horrific possible way. And that was the Assyrians. And the trouble with the Assyrians is they were just bigger and better and stronger than everybody. Not better in like an ethical way, but bigger and better, meaning like they had an army that no one could beat. Like you could try to stand up to them, but it wasn't ever going to work. They were just, I mean, they end up actually blowing up because of a civil war. It's one of those situations. Like no one from the outside was ever going to beat them. <laughs> and so it, it, that's just who the Assyrians were. So the Assyrians end up conquering the people of Israel because the Assyrians conquer everybody. But before they conquered this, the people of, uh, of Israel, a couple of decades before, a few decades before, there's this guy named Jonah. And at this point, Jonah, just like the rest of the world, they all know who the Assyrians are. They totally know who these people are. They understand what they're doing. They know what they're out, you know, what they're out and what they're about, right? And, and so, as you might imagine, nobody likes the Assyrians. It was a mix of not just dislike, but like, it's that, it's that mixture of like being afraid of people. And also, like, being so outraged at what they do, and then it, that forms into, like, this weird hatred, but it comes from fear, and that's a really strong emotion. Like, like just straight up not liking people, that's easy to deal with. That's easy to deal with. But a fear-based hatred for somebody else, that's tough. And, you know, basically everybody had that, and Jonah was basically everybody. Jonah's a prophet. And God tells Jonah, I need you to do something. I need you to go to this capital city of the Assyrian Empire called Nineveh. And I need you to preach a very specific message. I need you to tell the people of Nineveh that God has seen them. And God knows them. And God knows how wicked and cruel and sinful and violent and murderous they are. And so God is going to punish them with judgment. That's the message. Now, I'm a preacher. I like to hear myself talk. I like to deliver messages. Currently, I am doing exactly that. I am, man, I'm so happy right now. I'm having so much fun. I don't know if y'all like it, but like I'm having a good time. In general, preachers like to preach. Prophets like to prophesy. It's what we do. Jonah is given a message that's really rather fun, if you think about it. 
Jonah is the equivalent of like the third grader who's going to go up to the eighth grade bully on the playground and tell him that his big brother is coming home from college and he has a switchblade knife and you don't have a switchblade knife, eighth grade bully, but my big brother coming from college does and he's heard what you've done and he's going to get you. That's the equivalent of what God gives Jonah to preach. Like, it's kind of a neat message. Like, from my perspective, that'd be a sweet thing. Like, man, there's no, like, there's no, there's nothing, there's no lovey dovey. There's no, like, oh, but if you repent, it'll be fine. Like, so they just, nope. Judgment is at hand. Just imagine a third grader saying that. So I would think. I would think that Jonah would be all about that. And yet Jonah is not all about that. You've probably heard the part with the, the fish, yeah? Because he runs in the opposite direction. Like, instead of going to, uh, to Nineveh, he gets on a boat and he goes in exactly the opposite direction to avoid preaching this message. Like, he could not physically, sort of like lighting himself on fire, do anything more to make darn sure he never preaches this message. And I would ask, well, why does he do that? But helpfully, the story tells us exactly why he does that. Jonah explains that the reason he doesn't want to go preach, he says, is because he knows that if they repent, that God will forgive them. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want God to forgive them. He knows that God is patient, that God is kind, that God uh, is slow to get angry, that God is filled with loving kindness, that God doesn't want to punish anyone, even the worst people ever. And so by preaching, he's giving them a chance to not have that. Jonah, ironically as a preacher, says, I didn't preach to these people because God loves them too much. That's what the story says. We should emphasize that. But see, there's something that's unsaid in this story, but is demanded by the story. It's nonetheless true, even though it's not said, but I think we need to say out loud. You see, that whole God will, you know, forgive them and love them, if they repent, that is a conditional statement. It's if they repent, which begs the question, why, if the Assyrians are so bad, if the Assyrians are so wicked, if they are so cruel, if they're out to conquer the whole world, why would Jonah, prophet of God, assume that the people of Nineveh would repent? Why? Like, there's nothing self-evident about the repentance of the people of Nineveh. There's nothing there that would tell us, like, well, yeah, they would repent. At least there's nothing in the story. But if you're Jonah, and you understand the lesson that Adam's already learned, then there's a giant reason to believe that the people of Nineveh will repent. Because the people of Nineveh are to Jonah, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Jonah is connected to the people of Nineveh. Jonah is the same as the people of Nineveh. They're him. He's them. He gets it. He knows that. He knows the lesson that Adam learned, which means he knows for sure that he would repent. And if they're just like me, then if given the opportunity, he knows that they will repent. It is ironically Jonah's understanding of this thing that should get rid of our bigotry that makes him act in the most bigoted way he could possibly act. He doesn't want to preach to these people because he knows they're just like him. They will repent, and then he knows about God, that God will forgive them and love them and care for them and, and, and all of that. That's the point. His knowledge is the problem. Because his actions 
aren't aligned with them. So what you have is a preacher who understands who God is completely, completely understands who God is. He understands that God is loving and kind and gracious and merciful and compassionate and slow to anger and quick to forgive. And he understands people completely. He understands that even the, the, the worst people in his world are just like him. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, that if, if, if they get an opportunity that they will act just like him, he understands people, he understands God, and it is those understandings that makes him act in the most unfaithful way possible. And so he gets on a boat, and he goes to a place called Tarshish. Or at least, you know, he tries. This is what we read. In the book of Jonah, in, right there in the first, the first chapter, it says, The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship that Jonah's on apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. A little later, as he's talking to them, throw me into the sea, Jonah says, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. We got to pay attention to this. Instead, the sailors rode even harder to get the ship to the land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. And then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. So Jonah's got a problem, and it's not really the storm. The storm's not the problem. I mean, like, it's a problem, but we need to prioritize his problems. The storm is the second of the problems. The first problem is these sailors. The first problem is these sailors. And I think what Jonah was supposed to be, he's asleep and he wakes up. The guy needs an attitude correction. That's what Jonah needs. And I think he gets it by seeing exactly who he is in someone else. I feel bad for the sailors. They're like the, a pawn in this game here. But I also love the sailors because Jonah says, look, here's the issue. If you just kill me, everyone will be fine. And the sailors' response to that is, you got to be kidding me. I'm not doing that. We're not going to sacrifice you. We're not going to throw you into the, what are you talking about? No, that, that, that's not who we are. We're not killers. We don't murder people. We don't leave people behind. And so they ignore Jonah, and they push on. And the question has to be asked, why? And the answer is because the sailors understand what Jonah understands about people. The sailors looked at Jonah, and they saw someone who was just like them. Bone of their bone, flesh of their flesh. Here's a human being. Here's somebody who's in trouble. Here's somebody who's made a mistake. He has sinned. Which of us hasn't? Here's a guy who's in trouble. Here's a guy in our ship. Here's a guy who's just like us. That's why they don't want to kill Jonah. Because they see in Jonah themselves a person with whom they are connected, whether they like it or not. And so Jonah says, just throw me into the sea, and they say, nope, we're not doing that. And they fight for as long as they can possibly fight. But they were going to lose that fight. And so then it came to pass that Jonah, a man who sailors cared about and knew was just like him and knew they were connected to him 
here was the moment where they did not act the way that they believed. They knew who Jonah was. They knew how they knew how connected they were, and yet they threw him in the sea, as far as they knew, just to die. Which is another way of saying, Jonah, how do you like them apples? It's the proverbial taste of your own medicine. Jonah goes to sleep, he wakes up, and the roles are exactly reversed. And he feels what a lack of mercy feels like. Like I said, nobody thinks they're bigoted. Like Nobody thinks that. Like Nobody wakes up in the morning and is like, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to oppress some people. That's what I'm going to do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find somebody whose skin color is different than mine. I'm going to yell at him, at him on the internet. You see, everybody thinks they're right. Everybody thinks like when they oppress somebody that they're just you know, doing the right thing. When somebody's yelling at somebody on the internet, like, it's their fault. Like, as I, like, we all think that we're right. And I think we all, like, we all get it. Like, we all completely, like, there's that episode of The, the Twilight Zone. Uh, people are alike all over. Great episode. Twilight Zone's amazing TV show. But that's, like, 60 years old, guys. Like, we've all known this for, like, ever. Like, we, like, the lessons are just out there. We all know. The question is, do, are we going to act like it? See, there's way too many people like Jonah. There's way too many people like Jonah. There's way too many people like me. There's way too many people like me. Like, I can't tell you how many times, like, I've been bigoted and I didn't mean to. But you know what I do when I'm bigoted and I don't mean to? You know what I do? I very humbly admit my mistake and do better next time. You're supposed to laugh. That's, that's a joke. It's not what I do. What I do is I get very defensive. I twist their words into a pretzel, making me right in my own mind. And then I tell Stephanie about it when she gets home from work. You have seen what these people said. She's like, uh-huh. What's for dinner? You haven't cooked yet. What, what are you doing? Why do you take the dogs out? Well, I was talking to this guy on, on, on this, this website. Uh-huh. So the dogs haven't been out then? That's what you're saying? But this is what we do. And I convince myself I'm right. It's, we convince ourselves that we're right all the time. So here's the question. How do we wake up to this, right? I don't need to tell you to not be bigoted. You know that. How do, how do we wake up to actually doing that? And the answer, as it turns out, is um, the literal simplest answer in the world. Jesus said this in the gospel according to Matthew. He says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Here's what I love about this passage. You literally right now can go to any kindergarten in America. This is on the wall. And also, like, it's that simple. Now, you can take a five-year-old and be like, hey, just, like, would you like that person to, like, you know, twist his ear? ear? And why did you do that? Why did you bite his ankle? Stop, stop doing that. Like, it's that simple. Like, everyone knows, like, when you're five years old, you know, don't do, like, this is not a good way to act. And yet Jesus says this is such a complex, such a deep thing that it summarizes the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures. And I think that's true because, well, there's Jonah, right? Like, Jonah's a prophet of God. He knows what he's supposed to do. He understands this completely, and he's able to do it. And there's me. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I still don't do it. We all hate each other for a million reasons. It's hilarious. Like, we are connected to each other. Like, it's, it's not funny, haha. It's, it's a funny, sad. Like, it's, like, we are, we're all connected. Like, we're all the same. Like, it, like all the differences we have in, like, race and, and, and religion and country and, and politics. Like, we're all, we're all the same people, right? And yet we find a reason to dislike each other over and over and over and over. We just find it. Well, that guy believes that unprovable thing. Well, that's why I don't like him, because I believe this unprovable thing. That guy was born with that skin color, which offends me, because I was born with a different skin color, which I didn't choose any more than he did. Did you hear they're married now? Oh, they got divorced too? Oh, okay. 
That was a joke. I like that one. We just hate each other for all these reasons. And so here's what we do. We end up treating one another like, did you hear that guy voted for that guy? Well, yeah, like that guy who was awful, like he voted for that awful guy. I voted for this awful guy. See the difference? This awful guy and that awful guy. We just sat down and we tried to figure out which awful guy, and they chose a different awful guy. Did you hear they listen to that propaganda channel on TV? It's true. They, they listen to propaganda. I listen to this propaganda over here. This is the propaganda that I like because I just like this news anchor. We just find reasons. And so what we end up doing is we treat people the way they treat us. That's not the golden rule. We treat people the way that um, we are afraid that they will treat us if we are vulnerable with them. That's also not the golden rule. We treat them the way that we've been treated in our past, and so we assume everyone will treat us in the future. Also not the golden rule. We treat them the way our parents treated us, the way our bosses at work treat us, the way our first wife or husband treated us. That's not the golden rule. You see, every situation has, every situation comes back to this, but it's so hard to treat people the way you would like to be treated. Because, you see, the way we treat people is so very often dependent on their character, on what they have done, on who they are as people, what integrity they have, what they believe. The golden rule says, you treat people the way that you treat them because of your character and what you believe and who your, what your integrity is and, and, and what your ethics are. And if we're saying, but what about them? Well, that's, not, that's never the right answer. What about them? They're flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone. They're just like you. They're acting the way they do because they're just like you. They're acting the way you do sometimes too. Somebody else is a jerk. It's because you're a jerk too sometimes. We're all the same. You see, here's at the end of the day, this connection that we all have. It's so important that we see it, but it's so much more important that we live it. And the only way we can live it is by taking responsibility personally for it ourselves. Jesus demanded that. He said the entirety of the scriptures boiled down to what you choose to treat other people with. The responsibility is on you. A couple weeks ago, we talked about what is and is not a you problem. We talked about fixing the world, right? That's a God problem. He is going to do that. It's not you. So don't worry about it. Okay, this is a you problem. How you treat people is a you problem. And in the end, we've got to understand that we are all connected to this earth. We are all connected to God, and we are all connected to one another, all of us. That's that story with the rib. That's what that means. And when we can see that, that's when the golden rule really makes sense. And that's when we can wake up and be the people we're supposed to be. So in our first week of our series called While You Were Sleeping, and our first lesson from this series is this. All of humanity is connected to all of humanity. Christ teaches us to live like it. All of humanity is connected to all of humanity. And Christ teaches us to live like it. The musicians are going to come forward. We're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week. To take God up on this offer of his love and grace and compassion because he is slow to anger. He is filled with compassion and mercy. And that's just how God is. The Bible teaches that uh, we're to repent to be baptized. That sounds like two things. It's really just one. In repentance, we are changing our minds, changing our hearts, changing who we are and where we want to be. And in baptism, we are aligning ourselves with Christ. We are saying, I am um, going to be with Christ just as he was uh, buried and raised and uh, lived a new life. So will I. If you never made a decision, nice more baptistry, we can uh, do that anytime. Uh, let's talk. If you're not already an immersed believer in Christ, you're looking, you're looking for a perf perfect church. This is not it. We do serve a perfect God. We want to connect, we want to call, we want to cultivate. We want to meet new people, we want to share the gospel, we want to grow up, we do it. We always want to be nice to everybody named Kyle. 
And we want to treat people the way we'd like to be treated because we are all connected. Flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone. As we